you all for taking the time to join us. My name is Abigail Ramirez, and I am with the California Department of Public Health, Climate Change, and the Health Equity Section. Before we start, I want to provide some instructions for turning on simultaneous interpretation for all attendees. To turn on simultaneous interpretation, find the globe icon at the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom screen and select your preferred language as shown by the yellow arrow. The mute original audio option will turn off the overlay of voices for a clearer sound as shown by the red arrow. This applies to those listening in English as well. So if you hear more than one voice, please click the globe icon and then click English and then mute the original audio. Please note, if you don't see the globe icon on the button, uh, bottom, your Zoom software may need updating in order to take advantage of the interpretation functions. Now, I will give these instructions in Spanish. Bienvenidos, buenas tardes. Gracias por acompañarnos a la reunión de hoy del Grupo de Trabajo de Salud Pública de Acción Climática de California. Mi nombre es Abigail Ramírez y trabajo en la sección de Equidad en Salud y Cambio Climático del Departamento de Salud Pública de California. Antes de comenzar, quiero compartir instrucciones para activar la interpretación simultánea para todos los asistentes. Para activar la interpretación simultánea, busque el símbolo de globo o el mundo en la parte de abajo de la pantalla Zoom y seleccione su idioma preferido, mostrado con la flecha amarilla. La opción silenciar audio original desactivará la supor superposición de voces. Si usted escucha más de una voz, seleccione el símbolo del globo, luego haga clic en inglés y luego silenciar el audio original. Tenga en cuenta, si no ve el símbolo del globo en la parte de abajo, es posible que su sistema de Zoom necesite ser actualizado para así poder aprovechar las funciones de interpretación. Ahora, le paso la palabra a mi colega Trinity Smith. Siguiente pantalla, por favor. Next slide. Thank you, Abby, for those instructions. And welcome again, everyone. My name is Trinity Smith. I use she, her pronouns. And I am speaking to you from the ancestral land of the Nisenan and Miwok people. I serve as a health program and policy specialist for the California Department of Public Health, Climate Change and Health Equity section. I am joined today by my colleagues, Osamu Kumasaka, not pictured here, but we'll share a picture with him uh, shortly, the, climate, uh, the tribal climate change specialist, uh, Dan Wu, our team lead, and Linda Helen, the manager of the climate change and health equity section, who will all be helping to guide us throughout today's session. Uh, this meeting is being facilitated by our team at the California Department of Public Health, or CDPH. The Climate Action Team Public Health Workgroup is usually co-led by CDPH and the California Air Resources Board, or CARB. Our workgroup meetings are designed to provide a forum for public health and other partners to learn about and discuss timely issues at the intersection of climate change and health equity. Today's presentations will center on the work and resources that communities have cultivated to sustain and bolster the mental health and overall well-being of youth and other populations inequity, inequitably impacted by climate change and systems of oppression. We will also hear about what state and local government can do to collaborate and support these community-led initiatives. Um, before we get started with all these great presentations and discussion, we do have a few more housekeeping items. Items. So in addition to ASL in Spanish yes. interpretation, Real-time captions are being provided today by eCaptions. You can find the closed caption feature along the bottom of your Zoom controls bar as shown on the slide here. Uh, with that, we'd like to remind presenters to speak clearly and at a measured pace 
for our captioner and interpreters. For this meeting, we have muted all attendees, but we encourage you to submit any questions you might have through the chat feature, also found in the Zoom controls bar and shown on the screen here. We do ask that you keep your video off if you are not presenting as well. Um, and for this will help for optimum viewing. Um, and we suggest going to the view icon in the upper right corner of your Zoom window and selecting standard or side-by-side -side speaker view for the best view of uh, our speakers. And if you have any concerns or technical difficulties throughout the meeting, please send a private chat to my colleague, Osamu Kumasaka, Dan Wu, or myself, and we will try to help you out. And a uh, reminder that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted online about a week after today at the California Climate Action Team Public Health Workgroup webpage shown here on the screen. And we'll put this link in the chat as well. Um, but first, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Osamu Kumasaka, to share a land acknowledgement for today's meeting. All right, it looks like Osamu might not be with us yet. Um, I know he's been having some technical, some internet issues recently. Um, so if you all will bear oh, with Trinity, us. Trinity, I am oh. back, I think. Okay, Sorry perfect. about that. Okay. <laughs> all right, so now over to Osamu. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Osamu Kumasaka and the pronouns I use are he, him. I am not Native American, but I serve as the Tribal Climate Specialist for the California Department of Public Health Office of Health Equity, OHI, in the Climate Change and Health Equity section, or CHEST as we call it. I am calling in from the East Bay from the traditional territory of Huichin, the ancestral land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. The conditions that exist today are not what tribal members and descendants of Native Americans would have made them. We acknowledge the grief, loss, and profound challenges that persist due to hundreds of years of inequities perpetrated upon them. Today in California, we celebrate the incredible legacy of survival, resilience, and wisdom of 109 federally recognized tribes, 62 non-federally recognized tribes recorded by the Native American Heritage Commission, and more tribes that are considering and awaiting recognition and their descendants. Many of these tribes are dedicated to reclaiming ancestral lands, protecting precious lifeways, and resisting the onslaughts of global climate change. Today, tribal members and descendants work together, heal together, and call for accountability from our state. Our team is committed to working alongside indigenous peoples in following their lead as they work to uphold their sovereignty dignity and identities. We seek to build authentic, mutual and lasting relationships with tribes and indigenous communities. Land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities. We hope our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand with us in solidarity with native nations. Solidarity can look like donating your time and money to tribes and indigenous led organizations, amplifying the voices of indigenous people leading grassroots movements for justice and healing, and returning land to tribes. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Trinity. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, Osamu. Uh, now I would like to welcome our uh, 
first presenter, Stephanie Welch, to provide some opening comments for today's meeting. Stephanie Welch is the Deputy Secretary of Behavioral Health for the California Health and Human Services Agency. Stephanie has over two decades of experience in behavioral health policy, program administration, evaluation, and advocacy at both the state and county level, working at organizations such as the California Mental Health Services Authority, the County Behavioral Health Directors Association, and the California Council of Community Behavioral Health Agencies. Stephanie holds a Master's of Social Work from the University of Southern California and a Bachelor's in Sociology. Over to you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am really excited to be here. I was, I was really um, uh, thrilled to get this invitation and I hope that I can share some background with you with some of our thinking in this space. And I wanna just first lift up and really appreciate that the, the title of today's meeting is really about community-led solutions because I wholeheartedly agree um, that uh, more globally, if we're going to address the, the mental health crisis and support our communities, they need to be with strategies that are led by community members themselves. So I'm quite honored to be here today to talk a little bit about what the state is doing um, in this space and also just really some things that we learned throughout the pandemic. Um, and so we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So this is almost a daily discussion in our media. It's a discourse that we're having with our coworkers and our families, but I think it's pretty evident that we have an ongoing growing need for behavioral health services. And, and frankly, they were significantly exacerbated during the pandemic and continue to be. Um, so even prior to the pandemic, the rates of serious mental illness, and these are kind of uh, mental health conditions that can lead to loss of employment, um, you know, challenges in the family. Um, they really need a lot of attention and care um, and support. And those uh, conditions have really increased um, more than 50% in the last decade. Um, and so that's a significant um, uh, change in how people are experiencing their own mental health. Um, one in 13 children in California have what we call a serious emotional disturbance, and there are higher rates um, of this condition amongst low-income children and those who are Black or Latino, um, and it's higher and relative to other racial and ethnic groups. Um, rates of suicide amongst our Black youth increased more than 50% in the last decade. Um, this was an alarming number. Uh, we also saw a short uh, spike as well during the peak of the pandemic amongst this population, which was quite surprising for us and concerning. Um, and then this is something that we also are, are seeing in our communities daily, which um, California drug-related overdose rates increased 96% from 2014 to 2020. That's really a pre-pandemic date. And of course, our opioid-related overdoses have increased dramatically in the last few years. Uh, we may even have some newer numbers than that, but that increase is over 100%. Um, and then on a more national level, it's not like this is unique to California. Uh, percentage of adults who are experiencing major depressive episodes with severe impair impairment, again, these are things that lead to a deep um, uh, impacts into someone's into someone's life um, and this grew by over 40 percent in the last decade and similar uh, similar rates even higher rates um, amongst youth so I hate to start on such a dark note but um, paints a little bit of a picture of kind of without anything else happening we have a lot of people who are hurting and in need of mental health supports and services um, next slide so um, we also have a, be a, a community behavioral health system that is um, really underfunded in terms of infrastructure. So um, between 1995 and 2017, the per capita psychiatric inpatient bed rate went down by 42%. Um, this isn't an, uh, we see psychiatric inpatient beds as a immediate temporary and short-term uh, 
um, acute response to somebody who's in a psychiatric crisis, not any kind of a long-term solution. But the number of beds going down by that much means that we don't have places to care for people who are in psychiatric crisis. Um, California has expanded access to substance use disorder residential treatment in recent years, uh, but there is a significant amount of more that needs to be done. There are parts of the state that are uh, completely, uh, absolutely no services are available for youth for substance use residential treatment. Um, it continues to be very hard to find places for individuals <clears throat> living with complex conditions and histories of, of mental health issues to find residential treatment. Um, and there are some counties in our state that may not even have a, a residential treatment available for adults with mental health issues. Um, UC San Francisco uh, recently did an estimate that we that here in California we have 41% fewer psychiatrists and 11 fewer psychologists, what we call licensed marriage family therapists, uh, licensed professional um, counselors, and licensed clinical social workers um, than needed. And so really this is saying we don't have the buildings and the facilities, but we also don't have the workforce to care for the need that is uh, deeply growing in our state. Um, and um, behavioral health practitioners that, of the behavioral health practitioners that we do have, um, uh, they're two, two times less likely to be Latino and three times less likely to be African-American and two times less likely to be Asian. And so basically what that means is we don't have a workforce that looks like California to care for Californians when it comes to their mental health and substance use treatment needs. Um, next slide. So um, uh, also for those who are, who are experiencing um, very complex issues, we need to have appropriate housing and income supports. Um, so um, many of our counties, our behavioral health stakeholders have really urged the need for us to invest in, excuse me, um, in affordable housing and housing supports and supportive employment for people who are living with more uh, serious and persistent conditions around behavioral health issues. Um, and uh, we also have an explosion of homelessness. Um, over 171,000 people were experiencing homelessness in California in the point in time count numbers from last year. Um, and this is often um, a, a point that's brought up brought up in the press that I think a lot of people think that the vast majority of people who are experiencing homelessness are also experiencing a chronic um, substance use or a mental health condition, but we would really argue that those numbers are less than one third, uh, closer to one fourth. Um, uh, of course, living on the streets and the challenges of being unhoused would of course incredibly exacerbate anyone's uh, or stretch anyone's uh, mental well-being. And so do wanna recognize that as well. Um, and I think something that is um, really uh, hard to uh, hard to grasp, but unfortunately, some of our most sick adult psychiatric clients um, that their rates of homelessness um, doubled in the last decade. And I would have to say that this is an issue that continues um, now that we are into 2023 to be a serious concern. We, we simply, with the rising cost of living, uh, rising rents, we have individuals who are living on income supports who no longer can, um, but those income supports just simply do not uh, pay the bills and they're very much at risk of, of losing stable housing. Next slide. So that's kind of the context of what our system is, is, is um, working on and, and struggling with. Um, but we really learned a lot from the pandemic, like so many others, and we've really been using these lessons to drive um, what we're focusing on with our behavioral health policy. So something that was, I think, pretty frustrating for my community, um, may, maybe many of you on this call um, are part of our um, network of mental health and substance use uh, providers you know, across the lifespan, but 
we knew uh, these numbers were um, emerging during the pandemic. So individuals who are diagnosed with a substance use disorder had a 30% increased rate of death due to COVID. Um, that's, you know, significantly higher. Um, and, uh, you know, was a number that we were, you know, lifting up um, in order to raise attention to the needs of people who are suffering from substance use disorders. Um, probably the, the, the statistic that we use most often is that individuals who are diagnosed with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder are nearly three times more likely to die to co uh, die due to, due to COVID. And this was only second to someone being elderly. So, um, uh, and this just represents that people um, often who are living with these complex conditions, they also have really complex medical conditions. And frankly, they're also potentially living in extreme environmental situations that put them at risk for both of those, both physical and behavioral health uh, issues to be exacerbated. Um, so one in four adults reported anxiety or depression during the pandemic. Um, women significantly reported more symptoms during the pandemic or the peak of the pandemic. I would say these most of these statistics were pulled from um, this, the um, CDC around uh, mid-2020 through 2022. Um, one survey found that women were uh, three times as likely as men to report suffering from significant mental health consequences, including anxiety, loss of appetite, inability to sleep, um, and trouble completing everyday tasks. Um, there are um, probably hours of slides that could be uh, lifted up as lessons learned of how people's um, mental health and mental well being was stressed during the pandemic, which I think is the focus of much of today's conversation. But it's important for me to lift up because it really did take a significant amount of advocacy. Um, so that behavioral health care workers could be prioritized for vaccinations and individuals with significant medical conditions and disabilities like people living with schizophrenia um, could be included in uh, prioritization for resources and services. Um, Unfortunately, some of uh, our individuals, uh, some of our Californians who are living with the most serious um, and severe behavioral health conditions are living in congregate settings. Um, and uh, these congregate settings were in many cases unknown. Um, and uh, we needed to figure out a way to, uh, like other congregate settings, like skilled nursing facilities to support our behavioral health clients and the workforce to be safe um, and uh, in this case, uh, prioritize for vaccination. Next slide. So some of the other lessons that we learned um, at Health and Human Services, we have something called the Behavioral Health Task Force. Um, it represents um, uh, most of our departments and offices, as well as a wide variety of stakeholders across the lifespan. Um, and so it is a, a helpful body to us to provide us feedback on um, the development of our behavioral health priorities and policies in this state. And we took some time in 2021 to really um, talk to our members who are, most of them are working in the community uh, in a variety of different capacities about really what they saw. And um, so that we could think about this as we as we moved forward with some of the work I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, towards the end of my program. Um, but um, most notably, something that was really stretched was access. Um, and uh, this, this group may be really familiar with it, but it's so important we think about the impact of climate, we think about um, you know, basically um, disaster response that needs to be available every single day of every year of the year. Uh, of the year. Um, and we need to be prepared for that in this particular, in the climate crisis that we're in. Um, and so we really learned that while digital um, and telehealth did work for, for many people, it especially did not work for those who were the most vulnerable, people who were homeless or unhoused, people who were justice involved, uh, people who were older adults and isolated, people who were disabled. Frankly, also people who were living in those congregate settings did not have privacy to talk to their providers, therapists, and support uh, specialists. Um, and certainly from our members on the task force, it was really underscored that Black, Indigenous, and people of color were not getting the same access to uh, digital support um, and that there were extreme disparities. Um, 
Um, we also learned that poverty and a lack of equity in access to behavioral health care was significant, um, that individuals who were already marginalized felt more disenfranchised with um, you know, programs closing down, doors closing down, um, and this real period of time, which many of you probably remember, where we were trying to uh, pivot to find ways to still interact um, together, um, but to do it in a safe way, in a safe space. Um, and then I think the pandemic really emphasize that we have an uncoordinated system of care um, and for people who are struggling with their mental health um, and on you know the whole spectrum of that that we'll talk about in a little bit um, there are a lot of, of, of resources at one that exist but they're not tied together for people and people don't even know how to access them so uh, you know they have to work with social welfare they may also have to work with public safety they're there they may be part of the k-12 through system or even higher education and so there's really a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that um, we're working with our partners so that people have a, a ease of access into the behavioral health continuum of care, which we're going to talk about next, I believe. So um, one, uh, just a couple, this is a nice transition into some of the work that we're doing now. Um, something that we learned um, when there is a disaster or there is a call for crisis response for behavioral health, we, we learned um, that that behavioral health is there to respond to the crisis. And in past, maybe um, in, other, in other disaster responses, whether some of the things we've just unfortunately witnessed in the last few weeks with the mass shootings or prior to the pandemic, which were our, all of our significant wildfires, um, people were often physically deployed to the scene to provide crisis counseling. Um, and what unfortunately that does is it does deplete often the local capacity of a system of which I've really described as already pretty under-resourced um, and struggling uh, to meet just existing capacity. Um, and so it really, it really impacted our behavioral health systems. They were trying to fulfill their obligation and responsibility and duty that they, you know, that they take very seriously, um, but yet it meant that they didn't have enough capacity to care for people at home with all of their existing issues. Um, so in the pandemic, and we had to come up with more creative ways to, to support people, and we couldn't necessarily do that by physical deployment. And so the, uh, the folks at the Department of Healthcare Services got really creative and innovative and responsive and, and worked hard to build up something called CalHope, which wonderful. It sounds like many people are familiar with. We'll talk a little bit more about it. And of course, I'm promoting CalHOPE um, in, my, in my background right here. Um, and so for individuals with severe behavioral health conditions, they, they may either be treated or reside in congregate settings, as I mentioned, but there was a lot of, of <clears throat> barriers specifically around federal guidance, and I don't know the whole scope of this particular work group, but I, I do hope that we're really having conversations with FEMA that made it really difficult to access priority emergency aid. And what I mean by that is in the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, again, we're all doing things new and for the first time, but um, there were really a lot of restrictions around, you know, support needed to be prioritized for people who were, who were saving lives or working in life and death situations. And unfortunately, behavioral health settings were not originally being included in that discussion, even though I believe there was an intent to. So I think we have some very specific work that we could do to make sure that the behavioral health care delivery system is fully accepted as part of the larger medical care delivery system that um, uh, is able to get support and guidance through FEMA when there are major disasters. Next slide. So I mentioned CalHOPE. What an innovative thing. I mean, we, we obviously um, have had things like warm lines before. We'll talk a little bit later about 988. But this really was a broad um, an innovative response, uh, taking an original program that, that simply uh, was a, had a small amount of funding and was really focused on providing crisis counseling to fire victims 
and you know putting it on steroids so that it, it would be appropriate for all of California to utilize. And I say that because one of in, in my mind, one of the best things about CalHOPE is that it is employing um, dozens and dozens of crisis counselors who look like Californian, uh, Californians. They can speak in multiple languages, they have their own lived experience, um, and they bring that to the work that they do in crisis counseling, which is so critical, kind of getting back to the comment I made at the top of my presentation about the power that community members themselves have to help their communities heal. Um, CalHOPE does that in a virtual way. Um, and, it, and it's still up and running, and, and we've kind of, of, of um, how do I put this? Uh, kind of, it's evolved. Um, and since we are, uh, we are all um, living in a, you know, pandemic world, which is an everyday thing, but we did feel like, you know, life has gone on, people are still stressed and still need support. And so we're excited to continue to, to look at how CalHOPE can evolve and continue to support Californians. Next slide. So I'm gonna make a transition here to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're working on and some of the things that we're doing now kind of based on um, what we learned in the last couple of years. So um, before we talk about some of the work we're doing in our little box there that's highlighted on crisis systems, I think it's important to recognize that we need to invest in all parts of the behavioral health care continuum all the way on the, the left-hand side, um, my left-hand side, which is behavioral health promotion to um, the bottom, which is really resilient support. So people who, who may need long-term care, but we won't need to support them to thrive in their communities and to be in a community-based setting where they have um, a rich life with lots of social networks. And so um, many of the things that we're doing in our uh, behavioral health agenda for under this administration as part of and part of agency is really to strategically invest across the entire continuum so that people can access the care that they need and the level of care that they need when they need it. Next slide. So some of our behavioral health transformation goals here at agency um, are listed there, but I want to just lift up a couple of different things and looking at the graphic that we've put together. Um, you know, our approach to uh, transforming California's behavioral health system is really making sure that we are investing not only in individuals, but also in the families and social networks, the sense of belonging that needs to be uh, there for all individuals and investing in communities. And so, um, uh, all of these elements are critical to building, um, you know, healthy, strong mental health uh, for our Californians. Um, and so the, um, the little colored pieces just really uh, lift up um, some of our various different programs that I don't have time to talk about today, but there's some hyperlinks at the end of the presentation if you're interested in learning more. But just to lift up a few, you know, we've got initiatives around reducing homelessness and, you know, focusing on um, uh, addressing housing insecurity, especially amongst, say, our, um, our transitioning foster care youth. Um, we are going to spend some time talking about developing a robust and adaptive crisis care continuum. Uh, we've got several different um, data initiatives to really help us look at data to make sure that we're truly advancing equity and we're really looking at disparities. Um, we talked a lot already about how we're investing in both people as well as buildings and, and so human capital as well as brick and mortar capital. Um, and probably one of the largest initiatives we have to really go upstream um, and uh, really create um, equitable access for California's diverse young people 25 and under is our Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, um, which really is doing a, a lot of innovative things that I think really translate into this new world that we live in, which is we have to be prepared to respond to a disaster every day. Next slide. So um, a little bit of context here. Um, we, uh, we, came out of 2021 and said, okay, we need to have a state plan that helps us understand what does our crisis care continuum look like um, and what should it look like in the future? And I think it's important for this conversation because we were trying to build up our crisis care continuum 
regardless of this responsibility that the behavioral health system has to also help address crises when they happen outside of our regular duties to serve people with mental health crisis. So it's a dual it's a it's a dual responsibility that the behavioral health system has that's growing. And so we have to really take a look at are we spending our money in the right places? Are we missing part of the continuum? And really do recognize that because of the climate crisis and because we're having so many natural disasters, um, this system has to be healthier and stronger, frankly. And, and we're going to have to do things differently and work with other systems in order to have the capacity to do so. So um, just a, a few things here on this slide. Um, a couple of other things were happening in this space. Um, one is we were having an increase in suicide. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, part of what was so scary about it is that there were significant increases amongst uh, uh, black and brown boys. So under the age of 18, um, which we hadn't seen before. And, and also a significant uh, increase in self, what we call self-injurious behavior or self-harm amongst young women and particularly of young women uh, of color. Um, so different emerging statistics that were troubling to us. Um, and so um, the other thing that was happening on a national level, which you may have heard of, is that we were the, the federal government was rolling out a new easy to remember three digit number 988 so that uh, anyone would have better access or hopefully would have better access to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, and so the other major thing that happened is that last fall, um, a piece of legislation that kind of creates a roadmap of how California will roll out this new easy to remember eight digit number as well as a stronger crisis care continuum was signed by the governor. Um, and so we have a, a set of tasks to do in developing this crisis, uh, crisis continuum plan. Next slide. So the project itself, uh, one wanted to identify a statewide vision for a full set of services for people experiencing crisis. That doesn't mean it has to be anyone who is a person living with mental illness. It's for someone experiencing crisis. Um, to define what our statewide essential crisis services uh, should be, to provide a high level um, view of the resources that would be needed. While we have a lot of current and one-time investments in, in behavioral health, um, uh, it is costly to have these kinds of services. We also needed to identify what kind of governance model a lot of players in this space and, and how uh, what kind of role should everybody play and then to develop a roadmap to reach major milestones. And I know that I'm getting close to running out of time. So we'll go, I'll try to go a little bit faster. Next slide. Um, the plan itself is really um, uh, designed in three buckets. One, which I, we think is really important and very important for this group is that we really need to focus on preventing crisis in the first place. Obviously, we can't necessarily pre uh, prevent disasters per se, but there are many things that we can do with community-based um, interventions to get people the support that they need before they're in a, a real crisis. Um, also, responding to crisis. Um, this includes our hotlines, our um, 988 call centers, but also um, social service response, um, crisis response teams, really looking at co-response and non-law enforcement responses to crisis. And of course, um, if someone is in crisis, they need to have long, they need to have care. And so um, uh, it's really important that we have crisis services, um, but also things that transitions people, transition people to long-term care. Next slide. And um, uh, looking at the time, I think um, there's a lot of information on this slide, but basically what it what it's outlining here is that, you know, over a, a multi-year period, um, a five plus year period, we really believe that um, all communities in California can build the capacity to provide these different kinds of services in these three buckets. And I can't go through all of them today, but certainly take a look at the slides um, when you have a little bit more time. Next slide. So um, wrapping up the things that we found in, in this process that we'll be publishing very soon um, will be that um, 
that uh, based on our preliminary research and many discussions with stakeholders, we do think that the California's current crisis system um, does meet 988 readiness, which is great, but there's a lot of geographic variation and we have a lot of, of improvements to make to make sure that all Californians have access to crisis care. Um, we have put together a plan that um, outlines how we can build towards creating consistent access statewide so that your zip code or your county or your city doesn't determine your care. Um, we have also outlined steps to improve coordination, both across and outside our continuums of care. Behavioral health has to work with emergency responses. Behavioral health has to work with education. Behavioral health needs to work with our veterans and our tribes. How do we do that in a better way? And of course, um, um, how do we measure what we're doing and making sure that we're creating more equal access for all Californians to get care? Um, I think we will... Um, move on to the next slide so we can wrap up. Um, the next couple of slides are just um, some significant um, financial investments that the administration has made in building out this crisis care system. Um, so um, again, there's, there's mobile crisis units, so the actual infrastructure, the cars, the vehicles. Um, there's the Medi-Cal mobile crisis service benefit, which is really helpful in the sense that um, people who are Medi-Cal beneficiaries will be able to have crisis service, mobile crisis services um, available to them, um, and there'll be Medi-Cal reimbursement. Um, and we are also publishing a plan, um, hopefully um, uh, any day now, which will describe many of the things I've talked about and our road roadmap forward to investing in our crisis care continuum. Um, and we have a partnership uh, with the California Office of Emergency Services to can work together to continue to implement um, uh, the, AB, the 988 system. Next slide. I'm gonna skip this because this is just dollar amounts. Thank you. Um, so we have an exciting road ahead of us. We had, as I mentioned earlier, there was a significant piece of legislation that passed Probably one of the greatest things about it is it gave us a funding source, um, a surcharge that will allow us to ensure that um, we have a well-staffed, diverse staff, um, linguistically uh, diverse staff who are working at these 988 call centers and chat centers and online text centers. Um, also something that's pretty significant is that if you are somebody with commercial insur insurance, that health plans are going to be required to uh, reimburse for 988 center services. Um, so really um, that's a significant change. And we think that that will be incredibly helpful to ensure that all Californians will have access to crisis services. We'll go to the next slide. Um, thank you. No, you can, you can, this is simply, um, I think it's important for this group just to know that the next stage in doing a lot of this crisis care planning, um, we certainly, I came here today because I wanna engage the expertise of this body, um, uh, obviously the expertise of our partners in, in the public health field. And how do we make sure that as we move forward to, to not only roll out this plan, but also to build out our existing behavioral health crisis system, how can it be also responsive, inclusive um, to some of the things that you're all learning um, and the work that you're doing around disaster response? So these are just some helpful links to many of the things I talked about today that you can learn more about on your own time. And thank you very much for inviting me here today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your perspective perspective and providing that statewide context um, for today's discussion. Um, so moving along, because we do still have a packed agenda, um, I will now welcome my colleague Dan Wu to provide an overview of uh, some of the climate change impacts to mental health we are seeing. Great. Thank you, Trinity, and thank you so much, Stephanie, for that um, presentation, which provided an important context and a detailed overview of 
you know, what the state health and human services agencies and partners are doing to address the growing need for behavioral health services and infrastructure in California. And as Stephanie pointed out, many of the lessons learned from the pandemic um, are really applicable to addressing um, other um, public health and mental health threats and impacts, including climate change. And a lot of these services and, and efforts um, she described are, are really um, necessary to support those, for example, who have lived through you know, the, the recent wildfires we've seen um, in California with flooding and heat waves and other disasters. And along with providing the individual behavioral health services and support, um, we also know that, you know, broader policy systems and, and environmental factors um, and, and the living conditions that, that we all, you know, live within um, really shape individuals' capacities to reduce the risk of mental health impact, right? So, so maintaining community mental health and wellness also calls for solutions that address things like housing, socioeconomic conditions, access to services, resources and opportunities, social connectedness, neighborhood safety, and other social, economic, and built and natural environmental determinants of, of health and well-being. So, so looking um, in, in public health terms, looking upstream at where are these broader you know, living conditions and, and broader factors that, that can influence our health and mental health. So part of why I'm, I'm so excited about um, our other speakers coming up later is that we'll, we'll hear from um, two groundbreaking examples of innovative community-centered um, youth-driven efforts that help to build community mental health and resiliency um, in the face of climate change. Um, the first will be about the RISE Center in Richmond, California, and the second is the West Fresno Family Resource Center's Sweet Potato Project. But before we turn to them, I want to set the stage a little bit and make um, more of an uh, explicit connection between climate change and impacts to our mental health and why building community resiliency is so important to preventing mental health harms and mitigating longer term trauma. The next slide. So this slide we've, we've shown, you know, in previous presentations for those who've joined our meetings before, but again, I think it's important to really capture the, the big picture, right, about climate change and, and why and how it touches all aspects of our, our health and well-being, really. Um, climate change affects, you know, access to basic needs of clean air, food, water, shelter, and safety. And, and this diagram um, shows a variety of pathways of how climate change can impact health. Uh, starting with the geophysical impacts like rising temperatures and sea levels and more extreme weather events. And each of these colored sections represents some aspect of how climate change related exposures can harm our health and well being. And, and many of them overlap or can occur at the same time, or some actually interact to make the impact even more severe or, or complex. Um, so, for example, health impacts associated with climate change could start with extreme heat, as shown in the orange, so leading to heat-related illness and death. But hotter temperatures also increase the risk of harm for people experiencing mental health challenges, partly because they're more likely to take prescription medicines that impair the body's ability to regulate temperature. Um, heat can also lead to things like mood and anxiety disorders, um, schizophrenia, vascular dementia, um, greater use of emergency mental health services, um, and even interpersonal aggression and violence. So, you know, for, for any who have, you know, experienced the, the brutally hot summer days that can, you know, occur in, in California, especially in the Central Valley, especially if you don't have air conditioning, 
you know, you, you'll know that it, it's not a pleasant experience at all. Um, the mood, anxiety, you know, your concentration ability all gets affected by the hotter temperatures. Um, if you look at another example, like wildfires and wildfire smoke, um, shown in the purple on the bottom left, um, you know, we know that wildfires can lead to direct injury and loss of life, and, and smoke can worsen cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. And from a mental health standpoint, um, actually a recent study of California's 2018 campfire found that survivors had significantly greater chronic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, anxiety, and depression um, than those in the study um, who had not been exposed to the fires. So there are lasting impacts. Uh, if you look at drought, um, so we know drought conditions can impact water supplies, uh, but it can also lead to stress, anxiety, depression, uncertainty, um, and, and even suicide, particularly amongst those who depend on the land for their livelihood, um, like uh, farmers. Um, so we see climate impacts, also including severe weather and floods, um, and other environmental changes um, that can cause grief and emotional pain, disorientation, poor work performance, will cause harm to interpersonal relationships and self-esteem. Um, for those who have been displaced by these disasters, you know, displacement can cause a range of negative mental health impacts due to loss of place, community, and livelihood. Um, and the impacts aren't just contained at the individual level, right? Community-wide impacts include strains on social relationships, reduced social cohesion, um, interpersonal violence that can include greater risk of domestic and child abuse, and increases in stress and PTSD amongst more vulnerable populations. So aside from the more acute impact of climate change, it can also take a substantial toll on our everyday well-being and anxiety levels. Truly, we're living in a time of eco or climate anxiety, um, and the impacts are hitting our youth especially hard. So another point that I really just want to emphasize here is that um, you know the, the impacts aren't felt um, equally. There is some communities and individuals experience worse health impacts from the crisis than others. Um, the population is facing you know greater vulnerability to have mental health impacts of climate events include um, first responders and emergency workers. I right? like seeing the disasters firsthand um, that takes a toll. Uh, migrants, especially the undocumented, um, elderly, youth, and uh, children, uh, people with physical disability um, or a mental health challenge um, or addiction, pregnant people, people who are institutionalized, farm workers, and people with low incomes or those experiencing homelessness. Um, so there are multiple studies that have found that women are more emotionally impacted than men uh, by climate events due partly to increases in stress related to caregiving responsibilities, financial hardship, and increases in gender-based violence. And vulnerability to mental health consequences of climate change impacts is disproportionately felt among people experiencing other inequities. So if you look at um, the LGBTQIA plus and BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, communities, experience higher rates of mental health issues due to systemic discrimination, stigmatization, and prejudice. And studies have shown these pre-existing mental health conditions can put these populations at greater risk during and after climate disasters or extreme weather events when the stress of rebuilding, displacement, and loss of loved ones and communities take a toll on mental health. So the overarching threats of a changing climate can also incite you know, despair and hopelessness in, in the face of these wicked problems, as, as, as they've been called, um, of climate change. Um, but at the same time, um, the same disastrous circumstances may also inspire you know, acts of altruism, compassion, optimism, and foster a sense of meaning and personal growth, as sometimes called this uh, post-traumatic growth. I 
people band together to mourn, rebuild, and console amongst the chaos and loss of the changing climate. For people who have faced adversity, including low-income people, communities of color, and people who struggle with mental health challenges, have often developed skills and assets that increase resilience to the impact of climate change, such as stronger community ties, the sharing of resources, and the ability to adapt and innovate. So taking a look more at what the state has done to, to understand more the impact of climate change um, and the prevalence of mental health impacts um, related to climate change events, um, and of climate anxiety or solastalgia among youth, our CDPH team, the Climate Change and Health Equity Section, uh, worked with the broader department and partners at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, to add two questions on the current administration of the California Health Interview Survey, or what we call CHIS. So CHIS is the nation's largest state health survey, randomly, randomly sampling about 45,400 households in California by phone and internet. The results are provided by county, race, city, gender, and age group in many cases. So although we don't yet have the full results, I can share some high-level findings so far. In response to these questions, um, for the team question, 38% of teens said, yes, the issue of climate change makes them feel nervous, depressed, or emotionally stressed. That would translate to approximately 1.2 million teens. For the adult question above on mental health impacts, those who experience any event, 21.8% said their mental health or in their household was affected. So that would translate to approximately 2.8. This is about 9.8% of total adults, including those who did not report experiencing EMD events. Um, so once we have the full findings, likely later this year, our hope is that these findings will help to demonstrate the need to prioritize resources and services to areas and populations experiencing the most mental health impacts of climate change. But that doesn't mean we can't take action right now. So although the focus of, focus of this presentation is not on the individual level, for those who want to learn more about ways to rebuild individual, or to build individual resilience and actions you can take in your daily lives, as well as what behavioral health practitioners can do, I recommend folks uh, refer to a comprehensive resource from Eco America, Climate for Health, and the American Psychological Association that I will put in the chat right now. Okay, yeah, actually this slide, yeah. So what are some ways we can work towards greater community-based solutions? One way is to apply a racial and health equity frame to mental health uh, with trusted to culturally competent providers representing and from their communities. And so this also involves prioritizing resources and support for people in communities that have faced historical and continuing marginalization, such as people with low incomes, people of color, and those experiencing homelessness or with disabilities. Uh, supporting mutual aid and community-based peer-led efforts and services and structures that build social cohesion between residents is also a key strategy. It's well documented that social cohesion helps prevent and reduce health impacts and climate change and mental health impacts. Um, I'm elevating um, some of what the International Transformational Resilience Coalition has worked towards, uh, which is encouraging support of community-based, culturally appropriate population level mental health and wellness um, resilience building initiatives that can enhance skills strength and resources to prevent and heal from trauma. So that includes providing community members with tools and skills to regulate and calm the mind, body, and emotions, increasing linkages to social networks, um, and to use hardships 
is possible as transformational catalysts to find new sources of meaning, purpose, and hope rooted in culture and community, and developing psychological preparedness prior to a traumatic event, it can help to reduce and prevent mental health. So finally, mental health impacts of climate change can be prevented through a public health approach at the population level, right? So that in addition to all the important individual level solutions. Um, but we want to, you know, focus more upstream towards prevention and not merely focus on individuals, you know, deemed to be high risk or show symptoms of pathology. Um, so this approach really prioritizes preventing problems and not merely treating them as they appear. Um, so that can include collaborating with others to meet people's basic needs. Right? You have um, necessary things like housing, economic security, food, water, safety, a clean environment, education, and transportation. Also addressing ex existing inequities that place some people at high risk of mental health impacts and the health impacts of climate change. So that could include structural racism and working towards racial justice and equity, um, dealing with economic inequality and other forms and finally, in order to address the root problems of what is leading to climate change, solutions must include policies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or carbon emissions, and uplift public health. That's a lot of what team at the CDPH Climate Change and Health Equity section focuses on, these solutions that provide win-win uh, benefits for climate and health. Um, so an example is um, increasing access to green space, right? There's a lot of um, research out there about the, the health and, and particularly mental health benefits of exposure to, to green spaces and, and even visual, you know, seeing and looking at uh, greenery and, and trees and forestry um, has a lot of benefits. Um, you can look at um, active transportation, you know, walking and biking. A lot of these um, definitely have physical health benefits, but also mental health benefits, engaging in physical activity and exercise. And, and green spaces and active transportation options also help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So these are the multi-solution um, strategies that, that we really want to elevate. Um, so by mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions, we can also mitigate the worst of human uh, health impacts expected from climate change, including uh, mental health impacts. With that, uh, that's a quick overview. A lot of this can be discussed in more detail, but hopefully that lays a little bit of uh, groundwork. So I'll turn it back to Trinity. Thank you, Dan, for um, yeah, a lot of that context and making the connection um, between what Stephanie shared and um, the relation to climate change impacts. Um, so now I am very excited to welcome uh, Kanwar Paul Daliwal. She is the Associate Director and Co-Founder of RISE in Richmond, California. She is the daughter of Punjabi immigrants whose journey to the United States was propelled by global shifts from colonial British occupation to US empire building. These forces have been both protective and predatory for Conwar Paul, her family, and her community of origin. These axes of privilege and subjugation guide Conrad Paul's purpose, which is to contribute to movements, communities, and legacies of liberation, to honor and heal the ancestors who fought for her existence and survival, and to forge a world that is just and gentle for future generations. Conrad Paul holds a master's degree of public health from San Francisco State University, so I will pass it over to you, Conor Paul. Thank you, Trinity. Can you all hear me okay? Can 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting Rise um, to be a part of this conversation and to share some of our learnings and work and praxis around, um, you know, uh, liberatory mental health. Um, I will say, uh, let me ask, how much time do I have? You have uh, 12 minutes. Okay. All right. So I will do a speed lightning sort of uh, presentation. Um, but what I really want to sort of offer in this space is um, we are an organization, we are a health home, we are building ourselves as a climate resiliency and liberation hub. Um, but really our work is to build loving healing relationships uh, so we can build loving healing community so we can build loving healing power to really create the systems and the world we deserve. So everything you hear and see is in service to that and is in service to centering young people um, to actualize um, that kind and spirit of power and systems in the world. So I'm gonna read this first slide about our roots. Rise was born from black indigenous youth of color organizing to change conditions in Richmond and beyond. They understood creative expression, centering relationships, and being adaptive and responsive as key tenets of safety, belonging, and healing. They called on systems and adults to build power together with young people to dream and enliven beloved community that is just and affirms their humanity. Rise Commons, which is our new expanded campus, was always part of our vision, a campus dedicated to lifting up youth culture, innovation, creativity, healing, and connection. And I also want to say um, with a lot of gratitude and humility, um, I'm very grateful to be um, an entrusted adult um, in this youth space. Um, it is not lost on me that many of the young people who organized for the space I'm in now are no longer um, in this material world with us. Um, they and others who are here are living kin organized for this space, knowing they would never directly benefit. So it was 14, 15, 16, 18 year olds um, really thinking about legacy and the next generations and what they need. And so um, I hold that very closely and with a lot of responsibility um, and gratitude. Go to the next slide. So a little bit about RISE, um, we, when we opened in 2008, um, we opened with 6,600 square feet. We just recently over the last year have moved into a 45,000 square foot campus. Um, and so I'm not gonna read this slide fully, but you can see the range and depth of programming, supports um, and uh, services that we provide. Um, we are located on the unceded territories of Ohlone and Muwekma lands um, in Richmond, California. And if there's anyone from Richmond who knows RISE, um, please feel, feel free to do a shout out in the chat. Always helps to know um, if folks know or don't know. Um, go to the next slide. So I wanted to also share here some of our, our framework around um, what it means to be a public health organization and primarily a liberatory public health organization. So as you can see, we are definitely versed in some of the you know, conventional dominant frames approaches of public health. So social determinants of health, um, you know, we know how to do logic models and theories of change and kind of widget counting. Um, and we understand, you know, the importance of coordination, collaboration, and that, you know, resources and sustainability are key for public health and health equity. And we are way more invested in liberation 
protection and freedom. Um, and so we really take what we know as we think are important and critical public health tenants and really push um, to really address the structural conditions of disease. Um, and what we feel like when we think about climate justice, when we think about health justice, really is about a reparations framework, the redistribution of risk and resources. And again, um, the sense of beloved community, uh, the feeling of beloved community and the actions of beloved community. And I think an example I'd like to share about, okay, what's sort of what's the difference between these is um, I wanna bring up the term resilience and resiliency. And so we know um, increasingly sort of the, the metrics and measures of resiliency. So like increasing resiliency to is often what we see RFPs come out with, um, RFIs um, that want us to respond to increasing the resiliency of young people in our communities. And I wanna push back on that, um, call in for us to really start from the affirmation that our existence, our young people's existence is our resiliency. That resiliency is really a baseline, not a benchmark. Um, and so we actually would feel like we are failing our young people if all we did was try to increase resiliency because increasing that is really in the context of how can I help you? Hi, hi, I hear someone, yeah, exactly. Um, so I feel like what I wanna offer is that if we only measured our success by getting young people to cope with oppression, that is a failure. Um, and so we are ambivalent and concerned that there is such um, heavy investment in increasing resiliency. Um, so there's that piece right around resiliency. So how do we really flip the script and understanding that resiliency is a baseline and that maybe where it needs to be increased is for those communities. Um, I think about for those who are white, occupy white bodies or white adjacent, perhaps increasing resiliency um, to disrupt the conditions that protect us, right? Because um, there's a sort of fragility and sort of a muscle that has not been used because we are so protected and benefiting. And so that is how, when we talk about ourselves as liberatory public health is what we're talking about. We ain't got shit to prove about our existence and our affirmation. So we wanna list that as our baseline, but what we are really striving for is for those of us, and I'll put myself where I, I am structurally protected, what's my work and my responsibility to relinquish that, that, that power, that entitlement, um, both ex explicit and implicit. Go to the next slide. Okay, so there's a lot of words on here, but I'm just gonna trust everyone's used to a lot of content. Um, I think the other part of resiliency is this, the, the concept um, of climate resiliency. And um, again, what we see when we think about resiliency is so how are we, is, is climate resiliency about the land being able to deal with ongoing and escalated extraction and exploitation based on white supremacy and capitalism and empire building? Or is resiliency um, a base saying, wow, like even amidst all this going on, the earth and the lands are sort of showing us and telling us and actually reflecting back to us how we are suffering. And so even the idea of climate resiliency is something we're trying to figure out. And we know that resiliency hubs are a very particular model that, you know, there's state funding offered for places that operate that way. So we understand like the language is important, um, the attunement to that, but really also want to make sure we're, we're uh, assertively talking about ourselves as a liberation hub. And when I say that, it does not mean, oh, we have arrived at liberation. We know how to do it. Come talk to us. It means we are constantly in learning, reckoning, repairing, celebrating, affirming. 
So what you see here is RISE's framework around trauma and healing. This framework really grides uh, drives how we do our work on the ground, so in the space at RISE, but how we also really know we must be committed to this beloved community, the ecosystems of care and just um, justice that are important. But as you can see here, um, again, we know we are missing stuff. Um, if you see something that's missing or doesn't make sense, we really invite folks to offer. We're, we're a learning organization. But it really helps us see and place like where are different dimensions of violence, including, including climate violence, part of this sort of larger atmosphere of the history, legacy, and structure of trauma, distress, et cetera. I think um, on the, the side of liberation and healing, I think this was raised. Um, I really appreciate Dan raising the ways in which um, we have resisted, our fortitude, resistance, the resilience, um, and even the joy and, and sort of, you know, fugitive spaces of freedom and liberation we make, sort of given the structures and systems we live in, um, that we are actually, we are actually capable of taking care of ourselves and each other and actually really experiencing joy um, and, and love and celebration amidst this all. And I I think again, how can we use that as a baseline to think about um, investments and resources and reallocation of resources? So you will have, I believe, all these slides. Um, it's it's I don't know, it's really hard not to be sort of on a place where there's some feedback and conversation. That's how I operate. Um, but but I will just stop here. Um, I think our last slide, the last slide I have, I want to make. Sure, there's room for our Fresno kin. Um, so these are just some of the ways, I think key ways in which we show up as adult allies um, in solidarity with young people. Um, and I think foremost remembering we are not in service to the systems and that can get really hard. Um, and I wanna acknowledge how hard it is for many of us when our hours are spent having again to create sort of the, the theories of change, um, create the evaluation plans, um, provide sort of proof of pain for why we deserve resources that honestly already belong to us. Like all of that is true, but we have to remember that again, who, who are we here for? Who are we centering? And I think that's also very liberating. When I remember and I'm really centered in that, then what I need to do to attune and respond to the system still feels on purpose. Um, I think the other thing you know, that I, I wanna say is our young people have shared with us as a power building organization that, and a direct service provider, they experience atmospheric distress. So, I know we're talking about climate, sort of the you know climate health here. Um, but when they talk about it in those terms, they mean that there is not one place they can go in their community where where they are not sort of trying to figure out what the threat might be for them, right? And we know that when we're in threat mode, what that does to our bodies, the allostatic load. So imagine young people, whether they're at school whether they're going to the store, their family, um, within their homes, um, that they're always sort of, you know, that fight, flight, freeze mode, they're always in. And so they've told us that it doesn't matter what systems they have to engage with, they are policed um, and surveilled by all the systems, including health systems. And um, so RISE really works to create ourselves as a space where they are not feeling that kind of surveillance, where they know there's they know where the adults are in the space. We're not hovering over them, but they know where we are um, and when they can access us, that they can enter into the space and programming in any way that works for them. Um, and that even if they never ever go to any program, the fact that they are trusting us enough to be here, um, that's, that's, that's all. So there's no sort of like prescriptive way they need to be in the space. And so they've also shared with us that what's important for them is as they have to navigate these systems that are harmful to them, they need RISE as an organization to stay proximate to those systems because sometimes we need to serve as a mitigator, a buffer, an advocate, 
Um, and so that's, that's, you know, our model because of what we've heard from young people and what that looks like is we've had young folks in particular, a, a few of our um, young black men who are members who have come at certain times and said, they have to engage with the police for whatever reason. They asked us if we would call the police to come to rise to have the conversation there rather than them trying to do it on their own because of what we know of the history, legacy, and what we've seen so recently around um, police violence um, and murdering. So those are the kinds of things that we are sort of yielding, navigating every day. So when we think about mental health and distress, if we, it is all structural. All violence is state violence, including climate violence. And so all dimensions of health have to be understood in that lens of what's the what's the risk to violence and to harm and how am I protected or vulnerable based on that risk? It's not about the behavior. Risk is a measure of structural violence. And so understanding that we show up with young people to name that, acknowledge that with them, but also to be real in what they need to do to navigate their daily lives. I hope that's helpful. I'm going to stop there. Again, appreciate being part of this space. Thank you so much, Conrad Paul, for sharing um, yeah, your, your RISE's liberatory philosophy and framing of the work and um, the work that we're all you know, trying to do alongside you and for challenging all of us here, I think. Um, so we will now take a short break, process what we've heard a bit, um, and plan to resume promptly at 1130 um, to hear from our West Fresno uh, Family Resource Center Sweet Potato Project.
All right, everybody, we'll get started here again. So we have time for our final presentation and some uh, panel discussion and Q&A. Um, I did just want to quickly mention that we had um, another presenter planned as well. Um, he unfortunately uh, fell ill this morning, uh, got a little flu, um, so wasn't able to join us today, but I would recommend to everyone interested in the intersection of um, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and traditional practices as a protective factor for indigenous and tribal mental health and climate adaptation to explore some of his work and research. Um, and I will post his web page in the chat for those interested. Uh, but we will move on to um, our final presentation, the West Fresno Family Resource Center discussing their sweet potato project. Uh, the Sweet Potato Project is a prevention and early intervention program that aims to prevent and reduce high school dropouts, substance abuse, and gang involvement among youth aged 12 to 18 in Southwest Fresno. And today we will hear from Patrick Hamilton, the program manager, along with program assistants, Andre Smith, Alex Rodas, Ben Britton, Asenia Porter, and Samad Walton. Uh, so over to you, team. Okay, good morning. Hello, my name is Patrick Hamilton. I'm representing West Fresno Family Resource Center. I am the project manager for the Super Tutor Project 2. My pronouns are he and him. And we are on the indigenous, indigenous land of the Yukoks and Mono peoples. Okay, on the behalf of the West Fresno Family Resource Center, I am pleased to introduce you to our Super Tutor Project 2, a prevention and early intervention program that aims to reduce high school dropouts, substance use, and gang affiliation amongst African-American youth ages 12 to 18 years old. Now, during this, adolescent stages or during these adolescent stages of their life, our youth are faced with psychological and emotional challenges such as peer pressure, uh, in search of acceptance and lack of resources, also homelessness. Now, as pillars, of, as pillars of the community, we are deeply aware of the roles we play in the lives of our youth and their families. This program was designed to promote resiliency, leadership, and coping skills. We are dedicated to providing a healthy and safe place for the youth to come, think outside the box, dream a little, and create a hope and create hope for their future. Now, I will have a few remarks and quotes for our participants in our program. Next, Next slide. slide. Hmm? Hi, I'm Jalen Rodriguez. Uh, I've been in this program four years. I'm a 16 year old at Edison High School. I've been here since beginning of the project. I've seen it evolutionize with the entrepreneurship part of this program is a key vital thing for, for students and, and kids of all ages in our project. We hope to learn about business skills at Fresno State. They take a, I believe it's a summer course over at Fresno State to learn about business. They learn how to pitch products, how to market your product. Hi, hi my name is Demaria Edwards. I'm 15 years old. We're just not a program. We're a family. Also, we encourage each other to think outside the box and we encourage each other to see a better future as we go in life. Hi, I'm Samaj. I'm 15 years old. What the sweet potato did to impact my life is teach me how to hold my mug. To hold my mug means is to be accountable for my actions. Hi, I'm Zariah Davis and I am 12 years old and this program has gave me confidence to raise my hand in class and become a better student. 
Hi, I'm Rihanna Taylor, and I'm 15 years old. Uh, this program has provided me a safe place and keeps me out of trouble uh, after school. I'm Marilyn, and what the Sweet Potato Project has taught me is leadership and entrepreneurship, and they provided us with opportunities to be going out to different events, socializing with new people. Hi, my name is Dorlea Woods, and this is my first year. And the Sweet Potato Program has taught me how to uplift my confidence with others. Hi, my name is Andre Smith. I'm a super, I am a program assistant with the Sweet Potato Project 2. The youth that participate in the Sweet Potato Project 2 come from a community plagued with violence, loss of life, poor support systems, and peer pressures to be involved in drugs and gang activities. Sweet Potato Project follows 10 ways to build resilience. Top three lessons favorite are making connections, accepting change as part of living, and nurturing positive views of yourself. Our lessons are tailored specifically to equip our youth with the necessary skills to bounce back from trauma and challenges they may face. Our goals for our youth is to help them reframe the picture of how they view their futures. Next slide, please. All right, listen, last time we were here, we talked about why we would weed. We, we weed out, the, we pull out the weeds because what? They threaten the plants. In life, you're gonna have to weed things out of your life because it threatens your success. Today, you're gonna look out and you see the plant is this high. So what is that thing, that, look around the field, what is that thing that's about this high? That's a weed. Now, if you don't pull out a weed, it grows bigger than your project. Look out there. The tallest things out there are weeds. In life, if you don't weed out the bad things, they get bigger than your situation. Right? So what we're going to do today, we're going to pull up the big ones. We're going to get the biggest guys. We're going to have you pull up the biggest ones out here. And then the rest of us are going to pull up the little ones. Everybody's got gloves. Don't. Don't walk on the hill, walk in the low valley part of the field. All right? Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Rodas. I'm also a program assistant with the Sweet Potato Project 2. Uh, mental health is a broad topic, and most of us are quick to shy away from the topic, even though it is crucial, crucial to talk about it. Mental health has so many aspects to it and is interrelated with climate change. Climate change impacts have been seen throughout the world we live in and in the Central Valley, it has been seen through extreme heat, wildfires and droughts. In Fresno, the most vulnerable and underrepresented communities are impacted by this global phenomenon. The youth in the Sweet Potato Project too come from these communities and are being impacted by climate change through inequities and in access to clean drinking water, clean air, education and recreational opportunities. During the summer months, our temperatures reach as high as 115 degrees, meaning kids cannot go outside for fun times as it is too hot and dangerous for the body. This extreme heat also affects our mental health as it causes frustration, irritability, lack of energy, low moods, short tempers, and anxiety. It can also cause mental fatigue, aggression, and high suicide rates. Extreme heat also has long-term impacts on our youth and their families like food scarcity, loss of employment, economic losses, and loss of social supports. High temperatures are also a risk for families who do not have air conditioning and are struggling to pay energy bills. If you can tell in the graph, last year in July, 2022, uh, we have had an extreme draw in Fresno and that's pretty much how it, it is throughout the year, um, not just in the summer. Our youth already face multiple struggles as mentioned before by my teammates. However, the Sweet Potato Project 2 provides them a cool and ventilated place where they gain life skills with healthy and hydrating snacks all in a fostering environment. Thank you. Next slide, please. Hi everyone, my name is Asinia Porter. I am a program assistant with the Sweet Potato Project too. Um, I will be speaking about the successes and challenges. 
So one of our challenges was COVID-19, the prevention of us being able to have in-person classes. So we went ahead and created an uh, online version of our curriculum. Um, Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church also opened their doors for our students to host some sessions there as well. On to our successes, our students planned and participated in numerous of our events, um, multiple events such as our sweet potato festival, our backpack giveaways, our harvest days, our sweet potato to scramble, and also our Halloween hunted house. Students also administrated 1,500 surveys amongst students throughout Fresno and Clovis on the stressors of COVID-19. We received um, field supplies as well as vehicle equipments from different agricultural labor companies. You can see them listed there on the slide. We are also recognized by the State Department of Mental Health Equities under the CRDP grant. Out of 35 IPPs, in the state of California, we were the only ones to find sustainability with our California's mental health department. Next slide. Hi, my name is Ben Brittany and I'm a program assistant here with the Sweet Potato Project 2. In the future, we plan on taking our business and marketing training to the next level by owning our own food truck in which our sweet potato products will be on menus, such as our sweet mini cakes and our sweet potato churros, uh, the list goes on. And we also plan to be involved in a dual enrollment education program, which allows our students to get college units while still in high school. And I feel that's a pretty great start off. And we also plan to get our curriculum uh, copyrighted so that our other our surrounding counties can duplicate the success in which we have. Thank you. Next slide. Today's harvest changing tomorrow's future. I will fight against all odds that stand against me. My circumstances shall not define me. I will not be shackled by fear, insecurities, or doubt. My past strengthens my present, which complements my future. I will never give up, ever. I shall succeed. All right, thank okay. you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're not done. No, I'm sorry. That concludes our, our presentation. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so now we will move into our discussion and QA with our presenters. So I will hand it off to Linda Helen to facilitate. Thank you so much, Trinity, and thank you so much to our incredible presenters. Those presentations were moving and inspiring and challenging all at once. Um, so uh, I would like to um, thank you and then draw upon your, your wisdom and your presentations to, to connect to some of our work and ask some questions. And then um, we will go to some questions in the chat if we have time. Uh, or folks can come off of mute and ask questions of our speakers. So you've seen today that we've touched on the challenges of climate change impacts on mental health, but really focused on on the ground solutions currently being enacted by youth and others facing climate and health inequities. Your presentations have embodied what our Office of, of Health Equity Deputy Director, Dr. Rohan Radhakrishna says, which is that risk factors are not predictive factors due to protective factors, quoting Carl Bell's Prospects for Prevention of Mental Illness. We heard Conwar Paul emphasize that the RISE Center fosters loving healing relationships to build loving healing power. At the Climate Change and Health Equity section, our understanding of both climate impacts and health inequities is that they are rooted in inequitable distribution of resources and power. Operationalizing equity is about supporting people facing inequities to have power and resources, or a reparation ecology, so as Raj Patel and Jason Moore put it. 
We also uh, heard that risk is a measure of structural violence and that public health has been part of state systems perpetrating structural violence on youth of color. Uh, we believe that resiliency should not be understood as BIPOC and oppressed communities needing to endure more suffering and dispossession. So given that fraught history and context, many of our attendees today are from local health departments or state agency programs. So I'd like to ask our speakers, what would you like to see local health jurisdictions and state agencies like CDPH do to support or collaborate with your and your community's efforts as allies in solidarity rather than perpetrators of structural violence triggering trauma as um, public agencies? Hi, I do have to jump off for my next call really quickly. Um, also, we're testing the fire alarms here, so you might hear stuff. So I think I understood the question as to uh, suggestions uh, for public health departments. <coughs> Is that correct, Linda? Yes. yes. I would really and offer- other I would offer, so the interacting layers of trauma and healing, I'm happy to share. There's actually a uh, reflection activity that we've done here um, and with other organizations to really map our, our personal and professional histories on that, and then implications for how we move the work. So that's one thing. Um, I would say any RFPs, any grants you're giving out, do not ask or require for what's called evidence-based programs. Those are racist and classist and ableist and all of that. Um, provide general operating grants. Um, and this, you know, it's, it's both like an action, but also deeper work, I think, especially for our white kin and partners. Um, and for those of us who are white adjacent, really letting go of the power and control that we need um, around the work um, and the way whiteness shows up and also anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. Um, I think that's the work that's ongoing, um, but there is sort of relinquishing the controls of the mechanisms of the state, which take risk. And so I think for all folks considering what's the risk you can and should take, and for white folks, you got to take more risk um, and you got to give stuff up and you got to be okay with that and be okay in the discomfort. It's nowhere near um, what um, our BIPOC folks sort of endure and work through and navigate. So on that, I'm going to jump to the next call. So thank you. Thank you, Conor Paul. And now I'd like to ask the um, the youth from the Food Potato Project and Patrick as well to uh, give us suggestions from your perspective. How can public agencies support your work? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just say just just support. Programs like uh, the Super Sitter Pro Project, uh, you know, for for most people, they have the barber shops, and some may have the uh, the hair salon. But for the youth here in West Fresno, um, they have the Super Sitter Project. So, just I don't know, just give us some support and and uh, help us out. Um, I would add that would add mental that. health is a public health issue, right? As um, our director put in the chat, um, adding the sweet potato project is part of the mental health support in our education education system at the state level, right? Um, we talk about so much about mental health, but we still see so many disparities going on and in with the state level, just making just making it a public health issue, because um, public health means healthy lifestyles. So, men and mental health is part of that. Great, thank you, Alex and Patrick. Anyone else from the Sweet Potato Project? Suggestions for how adult allies can support you?
and um, in addition to that, I'll also ask um, what what do you have next on deck? What is what is your um, aspiration for expansion? What what else would you like to see happen with your project? Hi, this is Yolanda. Can you all hear me okay? Hi, I'm Yolanda yes. Randos, Director of West Fresno Family Resource Center, and thank uh, the Sweet Potato team for such a great presentation. So I would say what would be next on deck, you know, Ben had mentioned uh, a food truck, right? And so um, part of the program is that youth go to Fresno State, they learn about ag business, they learn about marketing, communication. And so we want to take it to the next level in terms of having these kids actually operate uh, their own business. So culinary training, marketing training, business training. I think for our young people, um, and I think someone said it earlier in terms of hope for the future, right? Like if they don't see, they don't see themselves in the future, then that's how they get tied up in human trafficking and drugs and gangs. But an opportunity for them to uh, operate, you know, a business, I think would be just fantastic for our youth, uh, particularly in Southwest Fresno, is something that's never been done. And so we are excited about that. And then the other uh, opportunity is to um, have our curriculum uh, copyrighted so that we can share this. This is a model of a program that can be utilized throughout the state of California. While we're utilizing sweet potato, it could be other, you know, um, ag products that are specific to uh, different cultures uh, throughout the state of California. And so uh, thank you for this opportunity for us to share uh, the program and so my, my, you know, as a director, when you say, what can we do to help, right? So I, I hope that we can follow up on some of these uh, recommendations because we can say, yeah, we sure there's funding, sure there's education curriculum, sure there's, a, you know, the idea of a food truck, but, but how can you help? Those are the things that you can help us with, right? And so we will be following up, you know, with you to say, hey, you said, what, what can we do to help? Well, we put it out there. And so um, hopefully we can be able to get some type of support, you know, through that area. Thank you, Yolanda. Anyone else recommendations or final thoughts as we wrap up before I turn it back over to Trinity? What would you like us to take away from your work? I would say keep the I would say keep the kids in mind when you're uh, when there's an opportunity to help an organization. Think about the youth. The youth are the future. We should all put our efforts and energy into aiding and 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 preserving the future. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Wise words to end on. With that, I will turn it back to Trinity for some wrap up comments. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. You've challenged us, you've enlightened us, you've uh, given us next steps uh, for following up and walking our talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you again to Linda and to all of our presenters for. Um, their amazing uh, perspective presentations in the thought-provoking discussion there. Um, I think we all have something that we can take back, take in and continue to work on. Um, but with that, before we wrap up, um, just want to share a reminder to all attendees that the meeting has been recorded and should be posted online about a week from today you will be able to access the recording um, at the web page listed here, and we will paste this in the chat again. If you have any questions or want to follow up uh, with anything discussed today, please don't hesitate to contact us at climatechange at cdph.ca.gov. Uh, and I, Again, want to express our sincere thanks to all of our presenters, our facilitators, all of the other people on our team helping pull this together in the background, and to all of you 
for joining and listening in today. Um, so with that, I hope everyone stays healthy and safe and has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>